Good morning. <coughs> Today is Monday, the 27th day of Adar, and we're in the, moving, to, getting to the end of chapter 12, Parakul Base, Netanya. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this online show. We have to be very grateful to technology that enables us to keep on learning under these extenuating circumstances. <coughs> Perak Yud Base completes the introductory chapters of the Tanya. We've learned about the fact that every nefesh, ruach, and neshama has three garments, machshava, dibru, and maise, with which it expresses itself. And that there are three categories which subdivide into five which is two categories of tzaddikim, complete tzaddikim and not complete tzaddikim. All of them are completely righteous, never do a transgression, and have totally uh, subdued their Yetzirah. The complete tzaddikim have transformed the Yetzirah, the Yetzir, the negative in them, the animal soul, into a Yetzir type. Then, in the realm of the Rishayim, we have again two categories. One, I think, is just on the books. And the other is practical and applies to most Jews in the world. And that is the Rosh HaBatayv These are good Jews who have a Yetzir Toiv, who strive to serve Hashem, but experience difficulties and problems either in Makshava, or in Dibur, or in thought, or in speech, or in action, uh, and difficulties depending on the severity and the intensity of the desires that, that bother them and interfere with their service of Hashem. And then there's the last category, which is the wicked person who never has any thoughts of tshuva whatsoever <coughs> and his godly soul is as it were banished from him but not entirely banished remains outside of him hovering over him uh, waiting for the moment when the person will have even a thought of tshuva that he can that the, that the godly soul can rega regain some kind of relationship with the person and then we have the Benini. What makes a Benini different from a Tzaddik? The Benini never does a transgression, never did a transgression, never will do a transgression. So why isn't he a Tzaddik? This is what we've been learning. And in the life of a, of a Benini, the way the Altar describes it here, when a person gets up in the morning, and even on a morning like today, a gray, drizzly morning, chilly morning, Hashem reveals His greatness and bathes the world in light. This is a revelation of Hashem's greatness, and our own life returns to us <clears throat> to connect with the life of Hashem. After davening, however, during davening, the Yetzirah has no place because our contemplation of the greatness of Hashem in our mind fills us with fear of Hashem and the desire to be connected to Him, which comes down into the right side of the heart as a feeling of love. When you love someone, you love something, you want to be connected to it, we want to be connected to Hashem. <clears throat> and this spills over from a strong flaming fire in the right side of the heart to 
fill the left side of the heart as well, and then the Yetzirah has no place in a person's life, and he becomes, at that moment, like a tzaddik. However, after davening, and here's the catch, when the flaming fires of love die down, the Yetzirah returns with all his desires, and you say, what happened? What happened? And it's, it's as if the person never davened at all. He re returns to the world of distractions and desires, and now the, now the war begins. Then we learned on Friday, the last day, that even though during davening the person experiences great inspiration and elevation, nonetheless he is he's not called a tzaddik because he, ne he, he never is able to subdue and overwhelm the Yetzirah. Because, <clears throat> this is what he says, the advantage, a little light pushes away a lot of darkness. The light comes from the godly soul, from the wisdom of the godly soul, the chachma. Chachma is compared to light. And the chachma of the godly soul pushes away the darkness of the animal soul, which is from klippa. But it does not change the essence of the animal soul. The essence of the animal soul is not conquered by the essence of the godly soul. And that's what makes the Benini different. The essence of the animal soul does not budge. It remains exactly what it is, where it is. After davening. And so it comes out that after a person davens, it's possible that the foolishness of the Yetzirah, which is called a, an, an old king and a fool, can return into the left side of the person's heart with all his desires, all his desires for the pleasures of this physical world and all the distractions whether permissible or even, heaven forbid, not permissible. Kilu le ispalo klal, as if he never even davened in the first place. Ella, however, the Alter Rebbe consoles us and says, but in the Benini, and this is the difference between the Benini and the Russia, even the very high level Russia who looks outwardly to be a very righteous person. Shabadavar Isur, concerning something that's forbidden, Eina Oile Bedaite Laseis Ha Isur Bepoil Mamish Chasvasholam. It never enters his mind that it should be even conceivable that he should do something forbidden. Heaven, heaven forbid, heaven forbid. This is total anathema to him. So even though he is assailed by desires, the desires do not cause him to do anything about them. He pushes them away, as we're going to see in a few few lines down. Ella Hori Avera. We spoke about this on Friday, and I want to emphasize it. It's very, very important. Hori Avera Hakashimi Avera. Thoughts that are inappropriate. He calls them thoughts of transgression. Inappropriate thoughts. Thoughts that are not focused on the service of Hashem. And we spoke once in class about a kosher Yetzirah and a non-kosher Yetzirah. I would say <coughs> a kosher Yetzirah, like the, 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 the story we told of the, the young man who, who was so into baseball, the Rebbe said to his father, don't worry, it's a, it's a clean Yetzirah. So we have thoughts that are really not troublesome, 
just distracting, but they're not troublesome. And then we have thoughts which are troublesome, which we have to struggle against them because we know that they're inappropriate. And they sneak in. And once they sneak in, then it's very, very hard to get rid of them. And this, my dear girls, this is a danger. I have to warn you about it. Uh, it's something that we all suffer from. And this is something that comes with the technology of today, with the telephones and with the internet and with the advertising, advertisements and the images that are presented to our eyes. And once they come in, you can't get them out. And they, and what does it say here? Yohori Avera, thoughts of transgression are harder than actually doing a transgression because when a person does a transgression, he feels regret, he's sorry he did it, he doesn't ever want to do it again. He avoids thinking about it. He avoids coming near the whole, the whole situation. But when you have an image in the back of your mind, it pops up. It pops up when you don't want it. What does he say here? <clears throat> Thoughts of transgression, are worse, take a worse toll upon a person than doing an Avera. Because they, they rise up from the heart when you don't expect them. They come up into your brain. When you want to daven and when you want to learn and you want to be serious in your relationship with Hashem. How does the mind work? By all kinds of subtle associations. You think of one thing, and then you think of something else associated with it, and then you think of something else associated with it, and then you remember something that you saw, and how your mind just raced down this track, and before you know it, here is this undesirable image in your mind, and where did it come from? How did you go there? You were thinking about something that was elevating, something that was noble, and all of a sudden, you're thinking about something that you, you don't want to be there. And the, the thought of, uh, uh, of thinking about who you're davening to, when a person davens, there are certain basic things that you have to, to do. First of all, when you daven, you have to know what you're saying. What do the words mean? Well, it's a big task to learn the meaning of all the words. So you take a little bit at a time. So first you have to know the meaning of the words and you have to think of the meaning as you say them. Fine. Then that's not enough. You have to think who you're saying them to. Okay. Who am, who am I, before whom am I standing? And then you have to remember that Someone's listening. Hashem wants to hear your words. He wants to hear your thoughts. He wants to hear your, your requests. So if you're thinking about Bloomingdale's, well, then, then you're not communicating anymore. When a person goes to Davon, you have to think to yourself that for these few minutes now, you're going to be able to talk to Hashem. Hashem is together with you. Hashem is listening. He wants to know what's in your heart. He wants to know what's in your mind. Hashem is calling to you every day. Tell me, he says, tell me what's in your heart. Tell me what's in your mind. Well, so therefore, this is a, a, a very serious warning because it's a, it, it's a serious conflict. And any person who, who wants to be sincere in their life, is, has to deal with this. And, and everybody, every Jewish person, really does want a sincere relationship with Hashem. What's the relationship with Hashem? That I turn to Hashem and I open my heart, and I know that Hashem listens, and I ask His bracha, and He gives it. Well, this is what it says, that Yerhori Aveira, that after in the Bainani's life, this is the life of a Bainani. That after he davens, the Yetzirah comes charging back into the left side of the heart. 
and assails him with all kinds of thoughts. And these thoughts rise up from the heart into the mind and they, they stay there. <clears throat> Until you remember, wait, wait a minute, what's going on? And you start to struggle against it. Leval belay, because they confuse a person, says the Alter Rebbe. They confuse you when you're learning Torah and they confuse you when you want to daven. And what does it mean to daven? Davening can mean just saying a bracha with kavana, with understanding of the words that you're saying and who you're saying them to. <coughs> Again, you recall how Reb Zusha and Nepal would say a bracha by translating every word into Yiddish. And I can, you know, recommend to you, try it. Take one sentence from the davening, the Shema, and translate it to yourself as you say it. Shema, listen, hear. Yisroel. Yisroel is the essence of my, the Jewishness in my heart. Hashem is God. Elokeinu, He is our God. Hashem Echad, He is one. Ukamami Rizal and the sages teach us there are three transgressions that no one is exempt from them. They, they occur every single day. Ain't Adam Nitzel Mayhem. Nobody's and nobody escapes from them. Behold Yem every single day. Hear her Avera, which is thinking thoughts that are inappropriate. Thoughts of transgression. Ve'iyun tefillah, and being able to concentrate in one's davening and not being, be distracted. Wow. So don't be d uh, distressed if you're experiencing problems in this area because the Alter Rebbe tells us this is normal. This is, this is the life of a Benini. Now comes his comfort, words of advice and comfort. The fact that we began the morning by thinking about the greatness of Hashem, that He fills the whole world with life, <coughs> and that He's greater than the, the whole world, creates the whole world out of nothing, and that He's infinitely beyond the whole concept of world, and when we meditate on this, it leaves an impression. And this impression remains in, our, in the back of our mind, if not the front of our mind. And it inspires us with fear of Hashem. In the mind, intellectual awareness that it's appropriate in front of such a God, and such a great God, to have respect, to have awe, to want to do the right thing. And this translates into fear in the right side of the heart, not wanting to mess up. <coughs> and this then gives way to a sense of love, a sense of privilege that we have a relationship with such a great God. And this is love hamasuteres, which is hidden, v'chol hayamoni, in the right side of the heart. And this gives us this love, which, which becomes awakened now on the right side of the heart, gives us a power, lehis gaber, to overcome the blandishments of the Yetzirah, which is trying to undermine our efforts. Velishlet al hara, it gives us the power that we can control and we can dominate the evil in the left side of the heart. Hamisa'ava Taiba, which is the, this is the Yetzirah, the animal soul, <coughs> which desires all kinds of things from this world. But now I have awakened this natural love in my heart, in my heart. And this gives me the power, that the animal soul, 
the Yetzirah does not have any dominion or rulership in the city. Remember, we're fighting over control of the city like two armies, like two kings fighting for control of a city-state. And this love in the, in the right side of my heart gives me the power to resist and to overcome and to fight off the Yetzirah with his uh, insidious suggestions. He <coughs> wishes that his desires should become uh, realized in the garments of our soul. The three garments of the soul are thought, what we think, what we say, what we do. We're not going to think the Yetzirah's thoughts. We're not going to say the, the words that the Yetzirah wants us to say. We're not, heaven forbid, going to do the things the Yetzirah wants us to do, the selfish things that he wants us to do. Vafilu b'mayach. Of course, not in the realm of action. Of course, not in the realm of speech. These are areas that are easier to control. And now the Alter Rebbe goes on to say, and even in the mind, you understand what the, this Benini character is all about. Even in his mind, Levade, the heart Hebera, he's not going to allow the Yitzhahara to cause him to think about something that's bad. He has, he's not going to have any power or rulership to think, heaven forbid, and heaven forbid to think about Ritzoyne, to think about anything negative. And now comes the key word, Ritzoyne. You see, <coughs> the, whole, the key here is what you choose to do, what a person chooses to do. <coughs> and this is where cell phones and the internet is so insidious because it piques your curiosity. Let's say you're walking along the street and a bus goes by and on the bar you go on the subway and you're sitting there and you, you look around and there are these the, the, the subway is plastered with advertisements, many of them not things worth looking at. And something catches your eye. And you, you instinctively know this is not appropriate for you. So you look away. But then, for a split second, something interested you. It, 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 it piqued your curiosity and you took a second look. The first thing you saw was not your fault. You're walking along the street. Someone puts an image right in front of your eyes. It's not your fault. You didn't put it there. But when you get curious and you want to take a second look, maybe there's something about this that you didn't really notice, or it's worth taking a second look at it, it's very unusual. And you take a second look, uh-oh, this is called uber Thinking something willingly. Once you think it willingly, oh, you let it in. Shabbamaychei. The Benini will not allow himself lahar her Willingly, he will not contemplate an idea that the godly soul doesn't want. In his mind, the Alt Rebbe goes on, he will not willingly accept, heaven forbid, heaven forbid, he will not accept this thought which is an evil thought, a negative thought, not a godly thought. Which goes from on its own, just rises up from the recesses of a person's heart, from the animal soul in the recesses of the heart, makes its way up into your mind. Ella, so what, what happens? Well, it's there, you know. And you don't notice it. But as soon as you realize, wait a minute, wait a minute, where did I go? Where is my mind? Elamiyad, immediately. Baliyasilasham. As soon as I realize that this thought has entered my mind, Dechayu Bashteya Dayim. 
he pushes the thought away with two hands. And he thinks about something else. As soon as he remembers, she'll hear her ra. As soon as he recalls that this thought is inappropriate, it's not part of the game plan, it doesn't belong in my life, and it doesn't belong in my mind, I push it away. Now a person can say, I can't control my mind. It's not my fault, excuse me. If Hashem didn't want me to think these thoughts, if He didn't want me to have these inclinations, if He didn't want me to have these temptations, He wouldn't cause me to have them. I have a condition. I have a psychological condition. I can't control this. And it's Hashem's fault. He caused this to happen. The Alt Rebbe doesn't allow this. way of thinking in the life of a Bainini, he says, no. A human being is always created with the, the, the ability to rule over his heart. Our mind is above our heart. Whoever is in charge of the, in control of the high ground has an advantage. And we can push a thought out of our heart. When a person says, I cannot control the thoughts in my mind, the answer is, you can. You can. It seems impossible when you're your mind is on fire to achieve something. You want it with all your heart. You, you can, even then, take your mind off of that subject. It's very, very hard to do. It's very hard. And we don't ever want to be tested. <clears throat> it's very nice in theory. But when you're very, very upset about something, and, and, and Hasidus tells you you should be very happy, you should turn your mind away from what's, what's upsetting you, it's not easy, but you can do it. And I once heard Rabbi Jacobson give an example that when a person is very preoccupied with a certain desire and comes to his awareness some bad news, heaven forbid, but that's uh, very much more important to him. He forgets all about this burning desire. Like let's say a child, heaven forbid, fell off a bicycle and broke his arm and they call you from the doctor's office. You go running to the doctor's office to take care of your child <coughs> or any other similar scenario. And in the same way, a person can turn their mind away from their burning desires, which are coming from the animal soul, from the Yetzirah, which is sending them up to the mind, and you push them away with two hands. This is, the, this is how a Benoni deals with the struggle, with his struggles. And why is he not a tzaddik? Because a tzaddik doesn't have this struggle anymore. The tzaddik has been victorious in this war. And that's why he's a tzaddik. Ve'eni makabli berotzen, and he, the benini, does not accept this thought willingly. He does not entertain it. Once it's in his mind, it's there. He didn't <coughs> want it to be there. What makes him a benini is he doesn't entertain it. He doesn't allow it to, to be there. He says no. I'm not, I'm not consenting, I'm not agreeing to you. You are invading my home. Um, I told you the story yes, last day on Friday about this chassid of the Alter Rebbe. It's a very powerful story, very powerful image. So we repeat it again. The Alter Rebbe, this chassid asked the Alter Rebbe, how do you control uh, your thoughts when you have strange thoughts? He said, go to this chassid, he will teach you. He went to the chassid, he arrived in the middle of the night, middle of the night in those days, they didn't have street lights, it was, could be 8 o'clock in the evening. It was cold and raining, he knocked on the door, the chassid didn't open. He looked from a window, saw who it was, 
and left him outside. <clears throat> then eventually he took him in and he gave him a towel to dry up, a cup of tea, and maybe some a biscuit. And he was made him a welcome guest in his home. After oh, uh, some time, a few days, a week or so maybe, he saw that the the visitor was a bit depressed, a bit ups sad looking. He said, what's wrong? He says, well, I came here to learn a specific lesson from you. The Dr. Rebbe sent me to learn from you a lesson. And I don't see, I don't see your very nice, your, your service of Hashem is very admirable, but I don't learn, I'm not learning my lesson, the lesson that I was sent here to learn. He says, and what's that? He says, how to control strange, my strange thoughts that I don't want when I'm dominating and when I'm learning. He says, I taught you that the minute you arrived. He says, you did? He says, yeah, don't you remember what happened? He says, sure, I remember what happened. I knocked on the door and you left me standing outside. He says, that's right. If you are in control of your house, you let in who you want, when you want. And this is how the Benini controls the thoughts that are in his mind. If he doesn't want it, he doesn't let it in. He pushes it out. And so we have to have other things that we like to think about to prepare, just like a, an army has to prepare for battle. How are you going to deal with the enemy if he attacks you this way or if he attacks you the other way? How are you going to reply? How are you going to answer him? We have to prepare in advance to deal with the Yetzirah when the Yetzirah raises his, <coughs> his uh, thoughts against us. We have to have other thoughts that we really enjoy, that we can co contemplate and take our mind away from the desires that the Yetzirah <coughs> is assailing us with them. Uh, I give you an example. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I met a man, I knew a man He's still alive, the young man, lives in Australia. He came to 770 some years ago, and he was a student in Morristown. He was quite spectacular. He was a, a champion wrestler. He was on the, he headed the Olympic team from Australia, and he became a Baal Tshuva, Shomer Shabbos, so he bowed out of the competitions because it had to be on Shabbos. And I asked him how how did he become a wrestler? And he said, well, he was a really powerful guy. And he could do all kinds of acrobatics. He was really in control of himself. <clears throat> I think now he became a, a, a coach, you know, guiding people to physical fitness. That's how he earns his living. Very, very nice fellow. Uh, <clears throat> he said, I was a wild kid. My father was from Russia. I was a wild kid, my father couldn't control me, so he sent me to a wrestler to take lessons. And I studied, and I practiced, and I trained with him for years. I said, what do you mean you trained with him? <coughs> he says, I would learn to break a hold. If somebody put a hold upon me, like a wrestler's hold, he grabbed me and held me in a certain way, so I learned how to break that hold. And I would do it hundreds, even thousands of times, until it became just second, second nature. <clears throat> and similarly, to transform a negative hold where, where the opponent has an advantage over you, to turn it around, then you get the advantage over him. And there were procedures and movements that, uh, that he had to discipline himself to learn through hundreds and thousands of repetitions. And he became a champion wrestler as a result of this. And I realized from this, this is a very powerful lesson that we have to train ourselves in dealing with the Yetzirah. And we have to train ourselves that when the Yetzirah is going to attack us with a certain syndrome, with a certain unhappiness, with a certain desire, we have to know exactly what to do and how to turn our minds away from the thoughts that the Yetzirah, the animal soul, wants us to indulge in. 
And that's what the Alter Rebbe says, that when, the, when he realizes the thought has entered his mind, he pushes it away with two hands. Very vivid, graphic, physical image. He pushes it away with two hands, and he does not entertain it willingly that it should remain in his mind. Not to think about it, Willingly, how much more so? Kol shekain lahalese al hadas to consider it, to consider lahasese chasashol to consider doing it. Heaven forbid. When the Alter Rebbe writes "heaven forbid," he means it full force. Heaven forbid. Or you feel the damer boy, or to even speak about it, or to speak words that are inappropriate. Because when a person thinks deliberately and willingly, um, accepting a thought in his mind, he is called a wicked person. So he's a Russia. He's not a Benini. That second, that split second that you said, hmm, that was fun, that was nice. I enjoyed that in my old days. <coughs> this becomes the thought of a Russia and not the thought of a Benini. Vaha Benini ene Russia afilu sha'achas elam. The Benini is never a Russia, even for a split second in his whole life. Okay, now we come to the conclusion of the chapter. And this is marching orders. This is something everybody should memorize, get a hold of the English, and try to apply it to your life. Until now we're talking about how we deal with our own Yetzirah. What about with other people? How do we deal with other people? How does the Benini deal with other people? In the same way, concerning relations between oneself and others. Just like in the Benini, when a thought rises up from the heart into the mind, and he doesn't want it, he pushes it away. So similarly, when a thought rises up from one's heart about somebody else. Eza tina, vasina, a feeling of resentment, a feeling of hatred. Chas v'shalom. A Benini never has a feeling of resentment or hatred for another Jew. Does not allow it. Or eza kina, or jealousy. Oikas, or anger. What do you mean? I can't ever be angry? That's what the altar is writing here. Any anger, oikapeda, or a desire to pay him back, or resentment, I'll get even. Vidoy mehen, or anything similar to any of these feelings. Eine makablan klal b'moichei oberetsoinei. Just like the Benini does not accept inappropriate thoughts in his mind, images, or ideas, or desires, so similarly he does not accept any negative feelings about somebody else. That they should enter his mind, the other Abba, or his will. On the contrary, just the opposite. His mind rules over the spirit in his heart, which is the spirit of the animal soul. His mind rules over the animal soul. Just like in terms of thought, he pushes away the negative thought with two hands and he thinks about something else. Similarly, in the relationship with somebody else, a Benini pushes away any negative feelings and does the exact opposite. 
lisnagim achaverei b'midas chesed, and instead of behaving resentfully to somebody else, you, be, you behave with kindness to them. And this also requires premeditation. You have to prepare. You have to prepare. Because when somebody does something against you, says something insulting, says something hurtful about you or your family or something dear to you, you have to know how to respond in advance and not just blow up off the handle, you know? I used to take work to a printer, a quick printer in the early days, before, um, before a laptop publishing. And, <clears throat> and I would take in the materials and the printer would uh, put them together and make a poster and <laughs> we'd spend hours plastering them up all over the place. And this printer had a, a sign on her desk which said, Speak when you're angry, you'll make the best speech you'll ever live to regret. Because while you were speaking, that wasn't you, that was your Yetzirah speaking. Giving them such a telling off, like they never heard before, that was just pure Yetzirah. <clears throat> venting. Venting itself and filling your heart and your mind with anger, which anger is like idol worship. When a person loses their temper, they might as well just get down on their hands and knees and bow down and worship the chair. Yep. So you have to prepare because the Bainani, instead of allowing any feelings of hatred or, sent or jealousy, resentment, or being upset or anger, he does just the opposite. He responds with consideration and with love. Plan it out. Give it a try. Try it in one detail. If you succeed, you don't succeed, try harder until you do succeed. And when you succeed in one area, so then see if you could do it in two areas. That's how you work on yourself. So the Benini will behave with it to his fellow with kindness, and extra love. And he gets inner strength to, to suffer from this person's abuse to the nth degree. Yes, he goes on abusing you. You, you say to a person, Good Shabbos, how are you? He doesn't respond doesn't even want to look at you, you try, doesn't get anywhere, you keep on trying. Ad to the nth degree, you suffer from the, this abuse, and you never get angry, you never let it get the better of you. Heaven, the other says, heaven forbid, heaven forbid, heaven forbid, because there's a God in the world, and you want to serve Him, you want to do what He wants, this is what he wants from you. This is your test. This is your challenge. And, uh, and more than that, not only you're going to do good for him, you're not going to ever pay him back in kind. Yeah, I'll we'll give you a dose of your own medicine. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. No way. Okay, fasten your seatbelts. Ligmel hayavim taivis. The, the expression of the prayer is, Hashem, we are high of to you, Hashem, and you give, you greet, you treat us with kindness. You are goimel lechayovim. We are <coughs> indebted. We we are the ones who owe you, and you treat us with kindness. We have to treat with kindness those <coughs> who we feel are indebted to us. That, that they are mistreating us, we have to treat them with kindness. They are wanting, we don't have to be wa wanting in return. And he concludes this whole chapter from the Zoyar with words that galvanized the avoider, the service of a 
chassid to Hashem. Lil made me Yosef im Echav. There couldn't be any greater example of this than the story of Yosef and his brothers that they sought to kill him. They sold him into slavery. He was in prison for 13 years because of them. <clears throat> and when they came and they were worried he's going to take revenge upon them, he, he just says, don't you realize everything was for Hashem, for the benefit of all of us, that we should be, that we should be able to survive. And that's why he's Yasef HaTzadik. Thank you very much. Uh, good luck with your quarantine. Good luck with all implementing the lessons of this chapter. I advise you all to go over it, review it, and the Mitzvah Shem tomorrow, 8.30, uh, we'll begin chapter 13. Thank you.